Good morning, boys and girls from Black Powder Headquarters and the Bojangles Studio, high on Sassafras Mountain. CDA presents Real Tree Radio. Welcome to a brand new, unused Saturday morning. Bojangle Studio high in the mountains of North Georgia. This is O'Neill Outside presenting to you Real Tree Radio. Welcome to a brand new unused Saturday morning. Hey, hey, welcome everyone. Time to set the politics aside. Spend some outdoor time with your family. Go hunting, go fishing, camping, hiking, whatever the case might be. Separate yourself from a divided country politically and let's enjoy the outdoors. Let me give you the telephone numbers should you like to in- involve yourself in the program and join us. The telephone numbers are 404 750 in the Atlanta, Georgia area and worldwide at 800-972-8255 on the SB Nation radio and WSB from Houston and Dallas, Sacramento, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Columbus, St. Louis, you name it. You can listen to O'Neill outside. It's seven minutes after the hour, and we've got a big day planned for you, and we hope you'll join us. It's my pleasure to invite you to watch O'Neill outside television on Fox Sports South, Fox Southeast, Fox Florida, Fox Arizona, the Pursuit Channel. Oh, my goodness, and a myriad of stations all over the country. This week is Travis Johnson. He lives in Texas now, and he's chasing white-tailed deer out there. Let me tell you, this program is brought to you every Saturday morning by Hayes Auto Dealerships, CVA Muzzleloaders, Realtree Camo, Striplings, General Store, QDMA, Tough Shed, Pennington Seed, White uh, Zach Brown, Southern Grind Guest Book, Thoroughgood Boots, the Governor's Gun Club, Horsetown Stores, Cherokee County Toyota, and Snellville Heating and Air in Snellville, Georgia. How appropriate. We hope you'll join us this morning. We're talking fishing. Fishing is outstanding. The water temperatures are fabulous. And hunting, of course, the number one fur-bearing animal in North America, and there are 350,000 hunters participating in Georgia alone. And in the United States, there are 35 million white-tailed deer, more than when Columbus landed. We must have lots to talk about. This is O'Neill, and we'll be back. Before I got to get too deeply into substance here, some self-promotion, I'd like for you to consider going to O'NeillOutside.com or Amazon.com and look up O'Neill Outside. It's a book I've written. I think you'll enjoy it. It's a collection of stories of people and places along the way, and it's called O'Neill Outside, People and Places Along the Way. You can get it there at Amazon or go to O'Neill Outside, visit O'NeillOutside.com right there on the home page. And we will autograph, personally autograph the book and send it to you. And you can buy it there, or rather cheaply indeed, and I think you'll enjoy the stories. A lot of people have purchased the book. A lot of them have read it, and they got some great reviews. So keep that in mind. One of the things that, uh, that can benefit you is for you to uh, visit O'NeillOutside.com right there on the home page. And one of the banner ads right there is the Zach Brown guest book. Now, Zach Brown is a uh, an entertainer, a singer. It's the Zach Brown band. All of you've heard of him, and he's an outdoorsman. And so he has come up with, and it's just a beautiful piece of merchandise. It's the Zach Brown Southern Grind knife, and there's several models. The Bad Monkey. Uh, you just got a whole myriad of, of products and brands, pro- not brands, but uh, models. And you can go there and click on the enter and leave a question or an observation or something for the television. And if we use it on the television show, then Zach will send you a knife. And these knives are, well, they're made with super, super, super hard metal. The edge lasts and lasts. It's just a quality knife. 
and the one we give away on television, if we use your comment on the television show at the end of the program, it's a jackal black and tan, it's called. Fabulous. But so s people will send a lot of questions in, and so we use them. Where is it? Here we use it. Oh, here it is. We use it also on the radio program. And so I, I picked out a few that uh, uh, are very self-serving, of course, but nevertheless, these are some of the Zach Brown guest books. Uh, uh, Levi Brown from Cumming, Georgia. How can I see on the website your 2017 Big Green Egg Recipes? If you go to the website, O'NeillOutside.com, at the bottom on the right-hand side, you can see all the recipes and what O'Neill has to say about them. He's, what's this next guy? Uh, Todd Norby from Missouri Valley, Indiana. I've, uh, ha he said, hi, have you ever tried predator calling in western Iowa? The dogs are there, but would a shotgun be better in Iowa's environment? Tough to answer that question, Todd, because I've never done that there. Uh, I would tell you that my experience with coyotes, if it's in a heavily wooded area, like if I were hunting coyotes here in Georgia, besides being on a rather large food plot, if I were in the woods trying to call one in, might use a shotgun, but most places they use a rifle. I know Travis uh, has a show coming up in which he was coyote hunting, dog hunting, and he uses a... Uh, Bergara, I think it's a 6.5 Creedmoor, and he took one, I believe, at about 500 yards. Kevin Kessner from Sumter, South Carolina. Uh, he asked, how do I get the nocturnal bucks out during the day? Well, you hunt deer in the rut, stay in the stand all day, and... It's during the rut or the second rut, but here's the point in staying in the stand all day. Other hunters in your club, other hunters on that public land, they'll quit hunting about 10 o'clock or, or so, and they get up, they walk back to camp or walk back to the car or whatever the case might be. They will stir up the bucks, make them move, make them travel, and if you're still in the stand ground blind, tower stand, or otherwise, you will have an opportunity to take a buck that's still moving around. Remember, there's a first rut, and there's also a second rut. So let's handle one more question. And uh, Sal writes from Boise, Idaho, I love your show and the different places that you go. Uh, Travis handles most of the hunting these days, and he goes lots of places. But we, we, don't, uh, we don't go to exotic locations. Uh, Africa, uh, Afghanistan for goats or whatever. We try to hunt where you hunt, places that you can go and hunt the critters that you can hunt. We think that's much more applicable. Uh, applicable. I know that... Uh, they, uh, I know if you sh if you put a show from Africa or one of those places on television, the ratings just plummet. People here in the United States are not interested in African critters. Now, here's a question for you. Telephone numbers are 404-872-0750 or outside the Atlanta calling area, 800-972-8255. I know for a lot of you, even some states, the hunting season hasn't even opened yet. But uh, along the Georgia and the Carolina coast, it opened up in October. Uh, how has your season been so far? Give me a call. What do you, how has it progressed? Any suggestions? Are you learning something about deer hunting uh, prior to and during the hunts? It might be an interesting conversation. I know that uh, in my own case, uh, I hunted, well, I was on a hunt last this past week in central Georgia at a little town called, uh, oh, my goodness, it was near Roanoke, Musella, 
Musella, Georgia. I was with the people at uh, uh, the Furminator. They have some. They have a big hunt club down there. Great lodge, great food, fabulous. And it beat sleeping in a tent. But we saw very few bucks. Season hadn't started yet. The rut hadn't started yet. But there were plenty of does. So we got into a discussion. Part of the uh, part of the guest register there that week, this past week, was uh, how many bucks or how many does will a given property's herd buck mate breed during uh, the rutting season? And with us there that last week was Brian Murphy. And Brian is a scientist. He is the chief executive officer for the Quality Deer Management Association. And it, he's, this is not hunt camp gossip, okay? He is a scientist. They track deer. They, they understand white-tailed deer like nobody else does. Interesting. You're ready? I found out that generally speaking, the herd buck will only replace himself during a season. When he locates a, a doe in heat, he will spend anywhere from 24 to 36 hours with her. So dim, give, given a during rutting period of seven or eight days, how many can he spend some time with? And they have excellent records that would indicate that the herd buck replaces only himself. In other words, he has uh, other buck. He, uh, the doe he, with whom he breeds, he will only replace himself with another male, with another buck each year. And we'll talk more about that as we proceed. But I'm interested in your season. Give me a call. 404-872-0750-800-972-825. How's the season been so far? Hmm. A word, and then we'll be back. It's interesting that we talk so much about deer hunting. Welcome back. Uh, the telephone numbers are 404-872-0750-800-972-8255. We've been talking about the Zach, Bry Zach Brown Southern Grind guest book, which you can reach at O'NeillOutside.com. You can also visit there, as we answered earlier, at the bottom of the right-hand page on the homepage, you can see all of the Zach, pardon me, all of the Big Green Egg recipes and those for the Swaggerty Sausage, cooking with Swaggerty Sausage also. As a matter of fact, uh, we'll be doing that this week here at the Colors. This is uh, for where we live in the North Georgia Mountains. This is the peak color season today and for the, about the next 10 days before they drop away. We were talking about that. Uh, one of the things we were talking about in the previous segment was I spent a few days uh, hunting with uh, some guests at uh, the Furminator's property there in Musella, Georgia, and the presence of Brian Murphy. It is such a pleasure to talk with someone to discuss deer hunting, deer hunting taxes, deer behavior, and all those things with someone like Brian because he is not, uh, and I referred to it earlier as uh, campfire gossip. Uh, Brian and his staff, his people at QDMA, they are scientists. Uh, they track deer. Uh, and he, here's an example. It's 27 after the hour. Uh, i tell you what, let's go ahead and... Uh, Okay, let's go ahead and chat now with Matt. And Matt is calling from Texas on O'Neill Outside. Good morning, Matt. Morning, sir. How are you doing? Outstanding. How are you calling from where in Texas, Matt? I'm call calling from the Dallas-Fort Worth metroplex. I live west of, uh, west of Fort Worth. Okay, good. Good so, to hear uh, from you. Very good. I listen to you semi-regularly. 
Um, I have a, I took a, a, a font. I see a mating pair, a male and a female pair. Uh, it was last April or May, it was. Uh-huh. And so this isn't really hunting. They were pilfering my chickens, and they, they did a terrific job of it. I mean, they really got the better of me. And I, I spent several weeks trying to – I could – catch a fleeting glimpse of them. I bait traps, a coon trap. I hose them down. I cleaned it. They, they absolutely are. Uh, I had the most respect for these animals that they, they, they did me in. I did finally get the two of them. Uh, the female was, a uh, you know, lactating. You could see the teats on her, the whole nine yards. And I got the, uh, the bigger, larger male taxidermy. Cause they're the taxidermist. And I, I, the more I think of it, it's not, I didn't really take that animal. Uh, I, I, I was in my right to, you know, take it. He was just they were devastating my birds, devastating yes. my, my poultry flock. But, and I had the most respect for him. I went and got him taxidermy, and I have him mounted in a, in a, in a, pr- a prominent place within my home. But uh, I just wanted your opinion on that, you know, a pest animal like that, or, or a, what's the right word, you know, a nuisance. Uh, it's costing me money as, as it relates to my flock. Uh, I don't know. I just wanted your two cents. Uh, I, I can only say that uh, my evaluation of, of foxes and coyotes and so forth is that I'm always amazed at their intelligence and the fact that you can trick them once and trick them twice, then you won't ever trick them again. Did you did you uh, shoot these, locate and shoot, or did you trap them? So I, I ultimately trapped them. I, everything I read was tuna, fish, cat food, uh, canned tuna, all, all this stuff I – I kept reading, and they just they, they were not interested. They would not go around the trap. And I cleaned the trap thoroughly. Finally, I said, you know, they must be uh, – I don't count my eggs, my egg uh, clutch that I, that I collect. Uh-huh. I said, they, they've been around so long, and, the, and they're taking so few of my birds in the single digits. They must be eating eggs. I put an egg in the trap the next day. Uh, I found the shell of the egg removed from the trap. The next morning, licked clean, and the trap was untripped. That 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 male fox, as best I could tell, he went in there, removed the egg, didn't trip the trap, but he liked the egg. That's what I learned. He's been stealing my eggs for goodness knows how long. You know, who knows how many eggs he's taken from me. I went over and over. I, I went so far. I'm tying the egg down to the to the uh, the live trap. It, he stole uh, another six eggs from me. Just in the in the trap, it didn't trip the trap, which is uh, I was I, I gained the most respect for these animals. Like you said, their intelligence was 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 uh, surprising to me. Anyway, I finally ultimately did catch both the male, the, the breeding pair, with uh, my chicken eggs, the eggs that they seem to love so very much, in the coon trap, uh, and and then I was able to uh, uh, I, I actually took them both just uh, as quickly and humanely uh, as possible. So I, I trapped. They uh, they they are highly intelligent, and they no were in the chicken house or stealing the eggs or eating the eggs mostly at night, were they not? Yeah, absolutely. I I knew I'd I'd seen a glimpse or two of them, and and I told my wife I said there's a you gotta you, there's something see this you know and I hadn't seen the coyote it's uh, something she's like no 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 she didn't believe me and I was like no I'm telling you and then then as soon as our our uh, bird started to disappear I was like oh, okay. It was there's something going on here now, and uh, yeah, so they've been they've probably been stealing those eggs for for months in preparation for the the, the litter that they were mm-hmm. you know uh, it, about to have. And yes, Absolutely. interesting story, sir. That's very. Uh, it's almost it's almost uh, your story is almost complimentary. No, very much so. I learned so much about uh, the the gray fox. I mean, just the generic gray fox. I read and read and read and. And they, they absolutely did me and outdid me for the longest time, weeks after I had gotten photographs of them and I put a game to cam out and I uh-huh. knew they were there and I was doggedly pursuing these two foxes and it didn't matter. So how long had they duped me before I even got there? I mean, they, I have the utmost respect for it. Super complimentary, uh, very complimentary. Uh, the animals. It, they interesting. Are, they are uh, interesting. Uh, I find it interesting that they were gray foxes. I could be mistaken. Do you have an opinion on that? Uh, as best I could tell, they were gray foxes. That that was that that's my takeaway. Oh well, it's if they're gray versus red, it's easily told. The red one is very red, 
rust colored red and the gray is indeed gray and he doesn't have all that red uh congratulations uh what a uh what a fight that must have been what a what a uh, uh you had to be innovative evidently the the way that you did it so uh i'm glad you called sir that's an interesting conversation for our saturday morning show congratulations not quite hunting but it's the best the, uh, the situation i've been dealing with i thank you sir appreciate it you bet good day have a great weekend same to you sir Bye-bye. you bet okay uh hey let's see it's, we've got time for this i believe let's go ahead and talk to our good friend milton crabapple good morning milton Good you hey milton crabapple yes sir yes sir how you doing this morning i'm doing lovely i got a few hours sleep last night so I'm ready to go. I know you get up early every day. Well, I get up pretty early. You know, I go to bed early, too. Yes, sir. But anyhow, you ain't got you a nice buck yet, huh? No, I have not. I hunted this past week, and uh, all does. My my guest at the farm where we were was an archer, and uh, he had he been using a rifle, the hunt would have lasted about 10 minutes because a nice buck came in at about 100 yards, which didn't do him any good with his arrows. How about you? Have you men yet? I've been going, but I ain't seen one yet to shoot. Right. You know, but it's it's been tough. Lots of folks I've talked to, they just ain't seeing them this year so far. I see. Maybe they're off to a late start on account it was so hot at the beginning of the season. I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think probably uh, deer will move around. Sometimes bucks will actually kind of take a vacation from their, from their range. So who knows? Well, uh, there you are. You know, there's. I wanted to talk, give you a little tip if I could to pass along to folks Please. about deer hunting. Please. And now this is a mistake that a lot of folks don't think about because it seems kind of counterproductive. Okay. But now what I'm telling you is the truth, O'Neill. I'm listening to you. You know, deer have been, been dealing with predators for thousands and thousands of years. And they're just programmed to pick up on a predator in the woods. Yes. And they hear stuff a lot of times when they can't see it. But they hear it and listen to it, and they figure out what it is and whether it represents danger or no danger. Now, would you agree with it? Yes. So, when you're, it's important, O'Neill, when you're walking through the woods to your deer stand, when you enter the woods, you just need to walk at a steady pace, not too fast, not too slow, at a steady pace, and keep your eyes on the ground right in front of you. And don't ever stop and don't ever look to the side or nothing till you get to your deer stand. On account of they may be a deer 50 or 60 yards away hearing you going through the woods, but he don't know for sure what you are. You might be a wolf or a fox or a bobcat or a dog or something, but if he hears you going along at a steady clip, he knows that you ain't hunting that you're just going from one place to the other, and you pass on by, and he'll go back to what he was doing. But now if he hears you starting and stopping and starting and stopping and slipping through the woods, that represents predatory behavior. How be darn. And that deer will spook because he knows whatever you are, you're hunting. That's an, that is an excellent tip, Milton. Now, I know there's been times when you've been walking through the woods and, and all of a sudden you'll stop and look around and when you look over there, there's a deer and he just takes off. And, and he's and he's already been looking at you. Milton, there on kind of you discovered him. Milton, I'm going to put <laughs> you on hold because I have other questions for you. This is O'Neill. We've got to go to a break right now and we'll be back. 30 minutes after the hour, we're in the middle of a conversation with my good friend Milton Crabapple. Let's go back to Milton right now because he has... Milton, you've made a great point. Well, you know, you know, this is programmed into these deer to figure out what you're doing. Now, you've been walking through the woods before and stop and look around. All of a sudden, you look, and there's a deer 20 yards away staring at you. And as soon as he sees you look at him, he takes off running. Yes, sir, that is true. 
But now, if you'd have just kept on walking and disappeared, he never would have moved. And as soon as you got over the hill, got gone, he'd have went back to feeding again. Absolutely. You are correct. Or back to sleep, or at least bedded down. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He would but have now, there's moved. lots of folks come back to camp, and you say, did you see anything? And they brag. They say, oh, I jumped a big one. Mm-hmm. That's the worst thing you can do when you're hunting is to jump a deer, because that means... You spooked him, and he run off down through the woods. Now, other deer can hear him running. They see his flag, and they also give off a scent when that happens. Lots of folks don't know it, but they give off a, it's what's called a, a pheromone. And they give that off when they're alarmed, and other deer smell it, and they say, uh-oh, something's going on in the woods. I better get out of here. Something's after us. So the worst thing you can do is to jump a deer. Uh, on as a matter of fact, you've done spooked him, and he's done told all the other deer that you're there, and you probably ain't going to see nothing after that happens. As a matter of fact, I, I think I'm correct. You might find it interesting that that pheromone, that hormone, is excreted in his ho- his hoofs or his feet. I believe it is. Yes, sir. That's right. It's a it's a fear hormone. As a matter of fact, yes, that when you track a deer, a wounded deer, that's what the dog scents. Yes, sir. That's what it is, all right. Mm -hmm. So you're better off when you go to your deer stand. Don't look around. Do not exhibit any kind of hunting behavior. And the deer won't spook. And when you get off and they hear you going through the woods and then you get to your stand and stop, well, they figure whatever you was, you either went on over the hill or you bedded down somewhere. Mm -hmm. But you ain't no threat to them. Excellent piece of advice, Milton. Excellent. Anyhow, I can't wait to teach my grandson some of this stuff. You know, he's five years old. Mm-hmm. Kids are funny. He ain't quite big enough to do this yet, but he. Well, he can join. I was telling you, him the other day. I said, you know, it ain't it ain't nothing to be ashamed of to poop in your pants every now and then. <laughs> that ain't a problem. <laughs> Happens to everybody. He, if you're he keeps Milton. laughing at me anyway. <laughs> Wonderful job, Milton. That's a great addition to this morning's program, and I thank you. Stop by the jail. I will do that too, my good friend. See you soon. Much obliged. You bet. Now, next calling on O'Neill outside is Mal. He's calling from somewhere in South Georgia at 43 after the hour at on, on O'Neill outside. Good morning. Good morning, my friend. How are you today? Lovely. Good to hear your voice again. I see you all the time in Loganville in the program market. I'm one of your, one of your biggest fans. You're very kind. O'Neal, Thank you so much. I, I appreciate you. You know, we've got this new uh, this new regulation on the north side where we can fake deer, and I hunt with a group of guys, and everybody got their opinion about what you can and cannot use and the best thing to use for baiting deer now. I'm just curious as to what, you know, your experience, uh, where your experience falls down, and the best thing to, uh, if you're going to put corn or flavored corn or, you know, bring those bucks in, especially with the, with the rut coming. That's the first question. Second question is, when do you think the worst start humming this time of year? Uh, well, let me uh, let me tell you what I think about this deer baiting, okay? Okay. Uh, uh, I, I'm conflicted about that. Number one, whatever can get you into the woods, whether you're young or old, if, you, if that helps you be a deer hunter, then proceed, do that. Uh... Number two, the the hunter licensed hunters in the woods is how the Department of Natural Resources controls the deer population. However, the use of baiting to me removes the hunt. It, you're not as much of a hunter by baiting as you are without baiting. You don't look more to the more natural uh, indications that deer live there, that deer exist there. You just go to the corn pile. Right. So there's, there's lots of reasons why. There's lots of reasons not to agree with that. But I guess overriding, we've got to get deer hunters into the woods. And if it makes you successful, uh, there's a way to be successful, but if you take note, you can make it a hunt also, and that's what I would say uh, you should do. The hunter needs to pass along these 
the knowledge about the white-tailed deer. And that's worthwhile. Appreciate it. I do. Second question. You know, you say the rut's coming in every time, you know, every year at the same time. What do you think about this year with all the climatic changes? Say that again, please. You know, the uh, rut, you say, I've heard you say over the years that the same time every year the rut's going to come in. That is correct. It's going to take a couple of days. Now, I'm curious with the climatic changes this year, whether that, that's going to have an effect on the rut. No. It, it, it. Uh, whether it's a full moon, cold temperatures, east wind change, there are a lot of things that affect the deer behavior on a given day or set of days. But the rut itself, bullseye, same time, same day, same set of days. Uh, you know, uh, other things influence it. How much human encroachment has there been? How many does are there versus how many bucks are on the property? A lot of things affect the deer behavior and deer level of activity, but the rut itself, bang, it's exactly the same time because of the photo period. Well, Mr. O'Neill, I do appreciate you. I do appreciate that information that uh, Milton Crab Apple just gave us. And, you know, God bless you, my friend. I'm going on to the woods. Hopefully I get to get a big one today and appreciate you. Stay safe. You bet. Hey, call me next week. Let me know how you do, will you? Roger that. Will do. You be safe, my friend. Take care. You bet. Mighty fine. That's good. That's a good call. 47 after the hour it is. Uh, let's do the radio prize package. What do you say? We've got a lot of calls here. But let's give it a try. Uh, uh, where's my – oh, yeah, okay. Here you can uh, – the, the rules. You have to be 18 years old and never have won the prize package before. Your first answer is the only answer you'll be able to give. You can't discuss it with Jason Byers there at the – in the studio. And the list of prizes or in the prize package is the following. A fire aid, fire suppressor, $10 gift certificate from – Bojangles, Whitetail Institute DVD, Producing Whitetails. That's really good. Uh, a, a voucher for Swaggerty's Farm, a DNR hat, a regulations magazine, a keychain, game check wallet keeper, real tree hat decal combo, data sport forecaster, editions of the Angler, the Dude, and uh, magazines, two cans of Fisher's Choice Baits, Bug Band Wipe, and a Thunder Chicken by Mark Noble. And here is your question. Last week was a rerun of the previous week's show. The Georgia DNR state wildlife biologist was on the air with me that day. What is his name? What is his name? The state deer biologist. Okay, call 404-872-0750-800-972-0750. Uh, Eight two five five, and you can win the radio prize package. Forty nine after the hour. Let's talk about. Uh, let's l talk to Larry. He's calling from Atlanta on O'Neill outside. Good morning, Larry. O'Neill. Good morning. Hey. O'Neill. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. Good deal. O'Neill, I'm thinking of getting another hunting rifle, and so I want to get your opinion on on getting uh, either semi-automatic. 300 wood mag or single automatic 338 wood mag. What's the difference and which is better in your opinion? Oh, my goodness. It's, you know, the, the choice of a rifle, uh, it, there, there's so many factors that indicate or determine what kind of the rifle is going to be best for you. <clears throat> I like a bolt, bolt action rifle. Uh, to me, I have more confidence in its continuing accuracy. But where else am I going to use that gun? I'm, am I going to use it in Georgia? where the likelihood is it's going to be a 100-yard shot, or am I going to take that rifle also to Texas or Oklahoma where it might be a 400-yard shot? The, the greatest determining factor in that your choice of a rifle is how it fits for you and how you, on the range, your confidence in its accuracy. It is the barrel that makes a gun, a rifle, accurate. A quality uh, rifle. No, I use a Bergara rifle, 6.5 Creedmoor, a 300 short mag, and a 308. So I have plenty. 
Uh, now let me ask you: the accuracy between a bolt action and a semi-automatic is is the is the accuracy between the two significantly different, or is it pretty small? What's your oh, it, about it's that? it's tiny. I mean, it's fractionally, okay. it's so tiny. But when you put the gun on your shoulder and you put it on sight, that the difference how you feel after being on the range makes a lot of difference to me. After all, Larry, it will be your rifle and no one else's. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You bet. I hope that it's only slight, but I hope it meant something to you. It sure did. Tell me. Call me Bye -bye. back later and tell me what you bought. Okay? Mighty fine. Okay, evidently we have a winner in the radio prize package. It's 51 after. So let's go ahead and uh, <clears throat> let's go ahead and talk about talk to. Oops. Got it. Let's talk to Mike. He's on O'Neill outside. Good morning, Mike. O'Neill, I was lucky enough this year to bought 48 acres behind my house that I've hunted all my life. Okay. I've always hunted in ladder stands and a little pop-up blind because of not owning it. And now I'm thinking about putting the box stand back there, the big box stand. Uh -huh. your, your opinion, does it make a difference? Uh, well, it sure does make a difference in how comfortable and warm you are while you're in the stand. Now, that's for sure. The deer, the deer will get used to seeing that stand, so it won't make a difference. Okay, you just be sure and get that stand scent free each time after you use it. I like the big box stands because I can have a youngster or an amateur with me in the stand. And you can see so much better. You can take photographs so much better. You will see more deer likely, and you will less likely to spook them. They will be less likely to scent you if you're high up in a tower stand. I like them because I'm lazy and I can sit in a big chair. I got old enough, I'm getting good and lazy myself. I got a picture of the seven-year-old grandson the week before with his, with his dad killing a nice buck. The week after, he was sitting in a double ladder stand with me asleep. I got a picture of him asleep. Now, guess which picture he wants me to show off to everybody? Yeah, the one with him asleep. No, he wants to show that big buck, that big smile. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, <laughs> Good, I made a bad don't guess. Show yeah, don't show that one right there with me asleep. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad you're passing along your experience and your heritage. You will value the – take lots of photos, everybody. You will value those photos, and they will be in a remembrance for you. i got to go, Mike. I'll see you soon, pal. This is O'Neill. I'll be back. 57 after the hour, and uh, we've got the radio prize package to handle before the first hour ends. And my question was – uh, last two week, two weeks ago, we had a DNR state wildlife or state whitetail biologist on the air, and he was on for two weeks because of the fact we had a rerun. So my question was, to win the radio prize package, what is his name? So let's talk to Josh, and I think he's calling from Bethlehem, Georgia. Is that right, Josh? That's right. Good morning. And Josh, Good morning. what was that critter's name? Who was I talking to those two weeks? Charlie Killmaster. That's right. Do you know Charlie? I don't know him, but I've read uh, some of his articles. He's very, very smart and very well trained. He is a pleasure to be around to discuss the whitetail deer. Yes, sir. You got quite a prize package. Let us uh, give us a couple of weeks to round it all up so we can get it to you. And I appreciate you listening to the program this morning, Josh. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm headed yes, to the sir. woods right now. Thank you very much. It was worthwhile getting up and listening this morning. That's right. You bet. Good luck to you, pal. Thank you, sir. You bet. There we go. Uh, there you are. Josh is a winner, and I hope you uh, learned something from the program. We have a, a couple of calls all scheduled for you in the second hour of the program this morning that so that maybe when during the program, if you're on the way to the woods, on the way to the stand, on the way to deer camp, just to stand around and talk with your buddies no matter what. If you'll listen to O'Neill outside this morning, another hour of outdoors headed your way, maybe you will learn something.
after all, that has become over the years, after 37 years on television, that has become the purpose of O'Neill Outside Television along with Travis Johnson. That is, if you watch, if you listen, it's not the great adventure we are on. It's if you can learn something from the program, just as it is here on the radio program. If you can learn about it, you can be a better hunter, and if you're better, you'll get more out of it. First hour of O'Neill Outside's out of the way, but there's another hour of outdoors headed your way. This is O'Neill Outside, Saturday mornings, WSB and the Sports Broadcast Network, and we'll be back. 